Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, we're going to be talking about pass keys. Now, pass keys have been making a little bit of news because... There are some new improvements, and we've now dubbed it as pass keys. The cybersecurity industry has slowly been making improvements towards passwordless authentication, and the FIDO Alliance, or the Fast Identity Online Alliance, has been developing standards for passwordless authentication and making improvements towards those. Now, we've had FIDO 2... USBs and NFC keys for a long time. But earlier this year, in May, Apple, Google, and Microsoft announced a joint effort to expand that support for common passwordless sign-in standard created by the FIDO Alliance and the World Wide Web Consortium. And the industry has dubbed this joint effort as passkeys. Now, before you go any farther... Apple, Google, and Microsoft all agreed on something. Like, let's just stop right there and, like, acknowledge what a big deal that is. Uh, Apple, Google, and Microsoft don't agree on almost anything these days. And so having the big three all in alliance, all agreeing that pass keys are the future, they're the path forward, this should make you, dear listener, as you listen to this, wherever you are, sit up and take note that, This is where stuff is headed. So you can swim against the current or you can float down the lazy river with us and get toward a beautiful passwordless future. But this is happening. So get on board and let's get ready to learn a little bit about pass keys. So let's first talk about what a pass key is. Simply put, it's a passwordless login. And as you know, if you've listened to this show, Adam and I are huge supporters of a passwordless future. And so this was really interesting to us as we read through this technology. The new standard uses public key cryptography to authenticate your access to websites and applications. And instead of using a password for your account, you use an authenticator generated by a pass key or a pair of cryptographic keys. And The authenticator can be a multitude of things. It could be your smartphone, like your iPhone or your Android device. It could be a laptop. It could be a desktop. It could be a password manager that supports pass keys. And so the authenticator still requires some sort of verification, right? Like you need to log into your machine. You need to log into your phone in order to use that authenticator, um, whether it be a master password to your password manager or a biometric like face ID or or touch ID to your phone, something like that, which then adds an additional layer of security so that you can't just use the pass key without first authenticating to the authenticator, essentially. Um, Pass keys are then stored securely in a vault, such as like the iPhone's keychain or Windows TPM or other secure enclave or vault, however you want to describe it. Um, And then they can be synced across devices, which is really the improvement here, right? We've always had this FIDO2 NFC device or USB, which does create portability, but the barrier to entry for a regular user, like my mom, is going to be very difficult to carry around a USB device um, in order to authenticate securely to something. And so the portability of being able to sync those pass keys using, say, your iCloud ID or your Google ID or your Microsoft account and just having those keys there or storing the keys on your iPhone and having that nearby and being able to authenticate to any machine or website that you are using without having to put in a password, that's really where this is the future and where this is making that improvement. Agreed. And, and I remember 
when WebAuthn and Fido2 were first coming to market several years ago, um, I used to my, my title at Microsoft used to be Identity and Information Protection Technical Specialist. So identity has always been near and dear to my heart. And I was so excited over the promise of Fido2 passwordless hardware tokens, YubiKeys. And it works as advertised. It absolutely does. And it's incredibly secure and it's great. But, and here's where the but comes in, there are challenges with the human usability of them, which should sound familiar because that's a lot of the issue we have with passwords. Passwords conceptually can be very strong and very hard to crack without adding a ton of length to them or, or whatever, but you have to allow truly random character sets. Well, humans don't think randomly. You know, we, we make passwords in the models of like the English language and aligned to that. And and we've beaten this horse to death, so we won't continue with it, but it's a similar situation with the idea of carrying around a physical USB key. There's a barrier to entry. First off, I have to buy one. Second off, I have to know what to buy. Third, I have to know how to configure it. And none of those are, are super obvious to a lot of folks. And as a result, almost like that social network, that network effect where you want to be on social networks where everyone else you want to interact with is the same is true of like technologies like this, that adoption curve, right? And even though FIDO2 has been available for a long time now, I mean, we're talking what, four years or so since it really started to come on market in, in like 2018, I still can't use it to like sign into my Google account. Like Google has no passwordless method, period, which is just bonkers to me and drives me nuts every time I sign in to my Google account. But that's another story. The fact is like the major players still aren't adopting this because they're not seeing enough ROI to do that. They're not seeing enough adoption. So this is where we have to look in the mirror and say, okay, you know what? If it is synced across devices and it's more portable, does that increase attack surface? Sure. But is that a worthwhile trade-off to get mass adoption and to therefore make it accessible on all these sites and eventually reach a passwordless future? Because a theoretical perfect future doesn't do us any good versus a very, very strong, very secure passwordless future that we can actually achieve. That's what's worthwhile. So I think some purists will look at this and say, oh, well, now, you know, if I sync all my pass keys through my iCloud keychain, if that gets cracked, then I'm in trouble. Yeah, true. Same if your password manager gets, you know, compromised or whatever. Um, there is that eggs in all basket fear. And if, if you're a fan of tinfoil hats, feel free to still put all your stuff on FIDO devices that you have physical access to and keep under your bed or whatever. Um, but for, even you will benefit from this by creating mass adoption, by making this more user-friendly, by having an iPhone just friendly suggest to an user who doesn't know better, say, hey, this site supports passkeys. I'm going to save your passkey in your iCloud keychain. Cool. Okay, here we go. Um, that's what gets us to where we want to be, which is really removing passwords entirely. And we're nowhere near there until sites start adopting this technology first. I always talk about credible alternatives to passwords. And until we have ubiquitous or near ubiquitous adoption of passwordless technologies, we can't start removing passwords from the directory. You even look at, you know, I, I think Microsoft was one of the very, very first um, to allow you to remove your password from your consumer account. Um, your, your Microsoft account you use for Xbox and Skype and um, like Teams consumer and all that good stuff, your, your personal M365 account, you can remove your password from it now, which is awesome but we need way more of that to get to where we want to be. So this is, this is great. And I think that's what we're going to get into today is the, the underlying technology. The cryptography is tried and true. It's public private key cryptography. It's great. We know it's great. We know all the strengths of it, but we also know that adoption four or five years later, isn't where we need it to be. So how are we going to help make this more accessible, more adoptable by users? I think that's the key point for today's conversation. I think you're on mute. So like you said, Adam, this isn't 
new technology uses public private key exchange in order to perform that authentication. So when you onboard a new pass key, it generates that public private key pair. The public key is sent to the web server or application server. The private key is then stored on the device or the FIDO2 USB or your keychain, whatever it is that is secure, securely storing that private key. And every time that you go to log in, it'll send that private key. It'll do the public key, private key exchange and authenticate you without a password. Now, like we said, the, the, the difference is today I can do this with any site that secure that supports a FIDO2 web auth and standard. So for example, if I went to GitHub, I can authenticate using my username and password in an MFA uh, challenge. I can also, because I have onboarded a USB FIDO2 key, I can insert that into my computer and use that to authenticate without my username and password. And on my Windows device, I've also stood up another private key, public key uh, exchange where I can use Windows Hello for Business to sign in using that device or using my Windows device. However, if I switch to a different Windows device and I try to authenticate using Windows Hello for Business, it'll say, I don't recognize this because that private key was stored on that Windows device. Now, obviously, I can use my FIDO2 key on a different Windows device and it'll still work. But that's the difference here is that we've had this, um, but that portability of the key and usability for normal users isn't there. Um, Same thing with Apple. You might be able to store it on a device that has the Touch ID, but Apple um, hasn't really done a whole lot with passwordless sign-ins into their devices. There's syncing with your Apple Watch, um, and and they have implemented the Touch ID recently, um, but they haven't been able to sync those FIDO2 keys across multiple devices. So let's talk about how this works on the different uh, operating systems. With Apple, you do need iOS 16 um, on iPhone 14 or the latest Mac OS uh, Ventura in order to use pass keys. Um, and like we said, you can sync pass keys across your iCloud account. Um, you can even share pass keys via AirDrop. Um, and if you're on a device that you've never signed into, you could use your iPhone as the pass key to either share that pass key via Bluetooth or you could do it through like a QR code. So there's going to be multiple ways that you can use your Apple devices in order to authenticate via pass keys. I think Apple deserves a lot of credit for kind of going zero to 60 here really quickly. Um, they had kind of been a laggard in this space. Mac OS and iOS did support FIDO2 keys, you know, like YubiKey made one that actually had a lightning port on it that you could connect to your iPhone and it did work. Um, and, and Mac OS has actually had fine FIDO2 support for many, many years now. Um, but really it was, again, kind of Apple was very hands off with it, kind of doing their own thing. And they went zero to 60 on this because the, they now have probably the most complete passkey implementation across their ecosystem. Um, and they went from nothing to everything really, really fast. So tons of credit here. It's, it's actually a very seamless, very slick system. Um, Apple has actually had a very good, very strong security reputation as of late. This, this helps with that. So I think they deserve a ton of credit for what they've done here. Um, and in all honesty, this is going to be something that drives mass adoption. And then keep in mind as well that one very unique space that Apple operates in, and Google could do this too, but they tend to be more laissez-faire, is Apple will wield the App Store as a tool to force security improvements and compliance improvements and user-friendly improvements um, to companies and websites and everything else. So, for example... Um, within the last year or two, Apple, you know, 
released that sign in with Apple capability where they basically became a single sign on provider. And they required that all apps in the app store that had an, an account you could create on an app had to support it to be in the app store. And obviously that's too big of a market for people to ignore. Most people won't say, well, you know, forget it. See Apple. They, they will get on board. It is not difficult to imagine Apple within a year or two to start to mandate passkey support to be in the app store. Like if you want to be in the app store, your account authentication mechanism must support pass keys to stay in the app store. I'm not saying they've said that or they're going to do that or anything else. It's just understanding that Apple has that power and has wielded that power to, to be honest, for good in many scenarios. Um, and I could very well see them doing it again here. So really thrilled at, at what Apple has done because again, as far as driving this forward and getting to mass adoption, they've, they've delivered a holistic solution super quickly. Where now if you're in the Apple ecosystem and, and many people, you know, have that halo effect where they buy an iPhone and then they buy a Mac and all that, you have an end to end solution today. You can go to a site that supports pass keys right now on your phone and it'll be like, yeah, here, I'm going to create a pass key. You sit down at your Mac and it's going to be there ready to go. So you talk about like realizing that passwordless future in a hurry. Um, that's a really quick way to get there um, with, with a solution that's already end to end. Like, and, and again, if you asked us this in August, none of this had shipped yet. And now with Ventura out, which just came out like a couple of weeks ago and with iOS 16 now out in market for a couple months, like again, ton of credit here, man. They, they've really um, became a major player in this space. And it'll be interesting to watch if they wield their their market position to push Paskey even further. And to be honest, I kind of hope they do. That's a really interesting point that you made. <clears throat> and a side tangent, because you know, we've recently, of course, talked about the whole Twitter, you know, <laughs> wildfire, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> and uh I read that the the folks who were there, who are still there, their greatest fear was compliance with the Apple and Google App Store. They had an entire department and team dedicated to making sure that they were within the App Store compliance because if Twitter were to be kicked off the Apple App Store and the, and the Google um, App Store, Store, that would be a major blow right to usage like if you couldn't install it onto your mobile devices i mean that that would be the death of twitter mm -hmm. um and so you know that is that power that you talk about adam is no joke there there are companies with dedicated compliance teams to ensure that they're within the standards of apple and google's uh, play store and to be fair i think apple has often wielded that power for bad um or in their own self interest but I also think Apple sometimes does a really good job of knowing where they can advance users' interests and wielding that power for good. And they have done both. So to be fair, it is with Apple a double-edged sword. They have absolutely acted in their own selfish best interests many, many times um, and done things that weren't user-friendly but were Apple-friendly. But they have done the other two. Like sign-in for Apple is an interesting case where I think that had mutual benefits. Um, sure, that was good for Apple, but it, I mean, signing with Apple is way better than signing with Facebook. So, I mean, it was one of those like, you know, uh, uh, interesting double edged sword there. But anyhow. So, Apple uses Safari. If you're using it in iOS or Mac device, you do have to use Safari in order to get the benefit of the pass keys. With Google, it uses Google Chrome and the Chrome password manager. So you'll be able to store your pass keys within the Google Chrome password manager, which also means that if you install Chrome on a Mac or on a Windows device, that will also sync your pass keys across there. Same with Safari. I don't know if I would install Safari on a Windows device, but it is available and you will be able to do that. But as well as, you know, like we talked about, there will be ways outside of the browser for at least Apple um, where you can scan a QR code. And I'm sure that's going to be coming to uh, to Chrome 
where you can exchange that key via a, a QR code locally or if your device is synced to Bluetooth, all that technology is going to be there to provide some seamless exchange of pass keys. With Microsoft, like we've talked about, it is using currently Windows Hello for Business. And you can use Windows Hello for Business to sign into any site today that supports pass keys. Coming in 2023, we have already released that we said that we're going to allow the portability of pass keys using your Microsoft account, your MSA. And I'm sure we're going to implement some Azure AD authentication or storing of those as well. How it's going to be implemented, maybe via the authenticator, maybe via Edge. Not really sure of the details quite yet. As of right now, you can use Apple and Google pass keys on Windows, but you cannot port those keys that you're signing in with Windows Hello for Business to the other operating systems. But like we said, that feature is going to be coming soon. You have other options like password managers. And those, of course, will work across all devices, all operating systems, um, all browsers that have extensions. So one of the first ones to implement pass keys into the password manager was Dashlane. And then LastPass has implemented it as well. Bitwarden is coming. One password, which Adam and I are huge fans of, they recently announced that they're going to be implementing pass keys into the password manager. So other options will be there if you don't want to use the iCloud keychain or something else. You do have password managers, which I'm sure listeners of the show have their favorite that they're using. Yeah, that's just another great option is being able to use the password managers as well um, to accomplish this. And again, I I think we talked in the pre-show about this, Andy, one password as an example, and I'm sure other password managers have this as well, the ability to store that one-time passcode secret that uses to generate the keys. Um, it seems kind of conceptually similar to that, where I might have like a, a, a login entry for site X, and today I have username, password, and one-time passcode there. Uh, it might be possible to just store that passkey right in there as well. So that would be pretty, pretty slick and again, would support synchronization and multi-platform support and everything else. So there's going to be multiple options for how you want to do this. Um, Google Chrome's implementation will be cross-platform, although again, you you have to use Chrome. So there is the downside to that. Um, More detail to come on Microsoft on how we will make it cross-platform, although I I think your, your suspicion, Andy, it'll be Authenticator is probably a good bet because today you can use Microsoft Authenticator as a password manager and it does sync back with Edge um, for a consumer MSA or a consumer Microsoft account. So that would make the most sense for it to go. No inside information on that, just speculating. Um, but yeah, you know, it, you as security professionals, and, and I think I mentioned earlier when I was kind of teasing uh, uh, some people, what this will benefit you, even if you still say, I'm only storing mine on hardware-based FIDO tokens, I'm YubiKey for life, or, or insert your vendor of choice here, you can still do that, and this growing, the availability and ubiquity of pass keys only benefits you as well because you don't benefit a whole lot from the fact that like Google still hasn't implemented it today, you know, for your Google account. So if this gets them on board, then that's that's huge. Um, yeah, hopefully this will help replace passwords, but you know, let's talk about that. Yeah, I, I don't know if it will. I think the the hope is that it will, but it will take several years. Like passwords have been around for what, 60 years maybe. Mm -hmm. And I think it will take maybe a decade or so to start pushing out some of those old systems. And and very well, you may have systems that are going to continue to use passwords for many decades to come. But I think it will eventually replace passwords. Now, the problem is, in my opinion, let's use like Best Buy as an example. Best Buy is one of the sites that have pass keys implemented for it. So if you browse to bestbuy.com, you'll actually see where they've replaced the wording. It used to be WebAuthn and Fido, but they've actually replaced the wording that says use a pass key to sign into this website. The problem is, is that I have to use a password 
username and hopefully an MFA uh, challenge as well to authenticate to Best Buy's site and then onboard my pass key. Without that initial username and password, I can't just onboard a pass key. So I see that as a barrier. Like I want to be able to use a pass key to initially onboard or I guess onboard a passkey without having to use a username and password. Now that's not possible today. I don't know how conceptually that would be possible because you have to authenticate. So, you know, there's going to be some work there to do that. Right. So today I still have to use a username and password to onboard my passkey. And then even if I've onboarded a passkey, like we've talked about in this show, many in fact, I don't, I don't know of any sites right now other than the Microsoft consumer account that have the ability to take that password away once you've onboarded that passkey. And that will also be a big step into removing passwords from you know, our, our use because if it doesn't even have a password, I've just removed it and now I can only authenticate to that site using my passkey then, you know, that will be the biggest step towards that. So maybe, maybe we don't need to take away uh, onboarding a passkey using a password, but certainly I think we should be able to remove the password from that account and just authenticate using the passkey going forward. So that, until we have those options, I don't really see passwords going away. Um, And so, yeah, I, I think, It'll, it'll be a little while, and there's still some work to do, but the hope is that it will eventually replace passwords. Yeah, it will take a long time. And I think of, and I'm sure, Andy, it's not hard for you to think of a site you use that has like very rudimentary username and password support. I have this kind of janky site that I have to use to buy um, like contact lens supplies. And it's, it's very low tech, you know, it's a very ugly site and I am sure the authentication is not super secure or anything, you know, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. I have a super long password. It's unique to the site. So if their database gets, you know, dumped because they don't hash and salt their passwords or something stupid, like I'll be okay, you know, but it's still one of those things of those are going to be your laggards. You know, once, once this comes out, like your big tech companies, your major players, they're all going to be on board with this pretty quick. Again, sites that have apps in the app store. I, I again think Apple will will eventually enforce or mandate passkey support. Um, it's gonna be these mom and pop sites you use to like sign in to like pay your HOA bill or whatever. They're gonna be your laggards for sure, because they just don't have incentive to like really modernize their identity stack. And I think there'll be opportunity for you know CIAM providers to provide that service and help them get to this place. Not that I would push for like government regulation here, but it would even be awesome if we had some sort of regulation kind of pushing us in this direction. Although, you know, I, I'm not asking for more regulation, but maybe some sort of middle ground would be good. We'll see. Like that's that's kind of Apple's position almost. Um, I'm curious, you know, you made a really good point about onboarding. Like if I onboard a new account, can I onboard a new account from birth without a password? I don't even think even though MSA has, you know, support for eliminating passwords entirely, I don't know if you can go create an MSA without a password initially. I think you do. And then you have to go pull it back after the fact. But at the same time, those are all the edge cases that that have to be solved for, you know, and, and getting to that point. So it should be possible in the near future to create a Best Buy account without a password in the first place. You know, that would be cool. And that's where we need to be. And you, you see bits and pieces of this. Like today, if you get a Windows PC and you're setting it up as new, a Windows 11 PC, it's going to ask you to sign in with your Microsoft account. Now, if you've already configured your Microsoft account with passwordless and you've actually removed the password like I have. So I got a Surface Laptop 4 a couple weeks ago on fire sale from the employee store because, you know, benefits. And as I was configuring it with my Microsoft account, which does not have a password, it doesn't give me even the option to sign into that with a password to my to my like desktop. So when I open up that Surface laptop and I get the login screen, I get two choices, pin or face. That's it. I can't, cannot use a password to sign into it. 
So that's kind of cool. Like that's extending how I've configured that Microsoft account in the cloud to my local device as well, even though it's kind of all one and the same today. Conceptually, it's cool to see that carried all the way through that you literally don't have a password and anything associated with this doesn't have a password. And those are the kind of edge cases we have to solve for. And um, even though consumer Microsoft accounts have supported that now for like a year, uh, it's still not there for Azure AD accounts, which are like a work or school account. Don't support removing the password yet. So, you know, it's a, it's a continued work in progress. I agree. We're probably a decade or more away and it won't be com- entirely unusual to run into an occasional website that probably doesn't support it. Um, and you still have to create a username and password for, it. and you can grumble about it, but it probably won't go anywhere, but eventually they'll fade out. But I, I think your horizon is not, not a bad guess, Andy. I mean, we, we could be looking at 10 years or more. And, and the other thing too, is like that impetus. I think of like my mother, you know, she has a Google account until Google like forces a pop-up on her that says it's time to create a pass key and get rid of your password. Like she's not going to do that. And Google's not going to do that because that's money for them. People being able to sign in and be exposed to ads is how they make money. So as, as much as you may or may not think Google has good intentions and don't be evil and all that, ultimately that hurts their bottom line. If people can't sign in and get ads exposed to their eyeballs. So they're not going to be real hell bent on pushing people to move over to different authentication methods, especially ones that aren't tried and true and could potentially lock people out or whatever, as they're still adjusting to that new world. So we are years and years and years away from people who have already configured accounts with passwords from having those individual vendors, the Googles of the world from asking them to move because to them, they don't benefit from doing that financially. And I think that's a driver too. So to be determined, but these steps are huge steps forward. And I think make them more accessible for a lot of folks and there's more refinement and adaptation to come. But if you think of where we started, you know, four or five years ago with, with FIDO two keys and now where we are today with, with Apple, Google, and Microsoft creating a consortium and working together to advance pass keys. And now we have kind of a common brand and a common name. Those are all positive steps. And so we'll continue to track where this evolves and where it goes. Yeah. And I wanted to be clear, the MSA passwordless implementation I don't believe is a pass key implementation. I think it is just using the authenticator and signals from your sign in in order to perform that authentication. It probably will play a part in pass key implementation like we've kind of speculated on the show, but today it doesn't use that technology for the MSA um, authentication. And I'm hoping, like you said, Adam, like, People might go to a site in the future and it'll ask them to create a password and it doesn't have a pass key implementation. And they'll be like, oh, wow, I have to create a password for this site. This seems old. It's kind of like today where I go to a site and I try to enable MFA and it doesn't have that <laughs> option. It's like, uh, okay, <laughs> like, why don't you have MFA? Like even SMS. And hopefully like some sites like today, a lot of them will just prompt you to put in your phone number and at least have SMS. MFA built in or just automatically enrolls you. You know, that's the hope in the future where we'll browse to a site. Hopefully it just asks us to create a pass key and go from there. And if it asks us to create a password, we'll have this, you know, light bulb moment and be like, Hey, why is this asking (laughs) us to use old technology here? Mm -hmm. So hopefully you learned a little bit of something about pass keys and where we're going with the password of the future. This is really exciting stuff, um, especially for both me and Adam. We're huge proponents of identity and password list. And that's our show for this week. Thanks for listening and watching as always. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you have any questions or topics you want us to talk about in the future. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.